All right, it's almost 10.30, so shall we okay. start? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and, and a very good morning to all to our esteemed panel of speakers and attendees, teachers, lecturers, officers from the ministries, students. We would like to welcome all of you to our first webinar session organized by Oxford Fajar and Malaysian English Language Teaching Association, NELTA. <clears throat> My name is Anita Muhammad, and I'm the representative from Oxford Fajar. Um, as you know, you know, the situation that we are in now, the COVID-19 pandemic, it has affected the global education landscape, and it is totally a new world that we are living in now. Schools are closed. We can't have any gatherings. We can't have any seminars, conferences, no workshops. But we still need to be connected and be well-informed with the rest of the world out there. So that's why we, um, Oxford Fajar and Melta, we are working together to bring to you a series of webinar related to education. <clears throat> and uh, in our webinar series, we um, invite classroom practitioners and experts in the field of education to discuss current and important topics, like I mentioned just now, um, related to the education. And uh, if you want to know more, what further info, please check out please check out um, Oxford Fajar's website on the upcoming webinar sessions as we have a series of webinars lined up for you. Uh, we are planning to have at least one web webinar per week, but not that Raya week, okay? Raya week is off for all of us. <laughs> by the way, I must say that we are extremely overwhelmed by the number of participation for this session. We have its full house. So our registration, we had to close it at 500 and we've been getting a lot of emails and calls from people who would like to join this webinar. So you're very, very lucky to be able to, you know, get a slot in this webinar. So without wasting, my without wasting anybody's time anymore, um, I would like to pass this session to our uh, session's moderator, Dr. Prema Lata Nair. Dr. Prema is a senior lecturer at the uh, Institute of Teach Teacher Education, International Languages Campus in Kuala Lumpur. She has been involved in conducting workshops in the area of language assessment for primary schools and, teach, uh, and teaching teachers for KSSR. So over to you, Dr. Prema. Thank you. Thank you, Puan Anita. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first series of webinar brought to you by Oxford Fajar and Melta. I'll be working behind the scenes of today's webinar. First of all, I would like to thank you, the audience, for taking time out and being here at this particular moment. Today, we are privileged to have with us three distinguished panel discussants who will be unpacking one pertinent issue, that is, assessing English language learners. I'm sure you have many questions that are running in your minds right now. So let me start by introducing to you our first discussant, Dr. Ramesh Nair, who is the Associate Professor at the Academy of Language Studies, University of Technology, Mara, and the President of the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association. How are you, Doctor? Good, thank you. Second, we have Datin Dr. Mazia Hayati Abdullah, who is a member of the English Language Standards and Quality Council, Ministry of Education Malaysia, and retired Associate Professor from the Faculty of Modern Languages and Communication, University of Malaysia. How are you, Datin? Good to go? Fine, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Our third panelist is Ms. Jaya Pushani Ponyodurai, who is a member of the English Language Standards and Quality Council, Ministry of Education Malaysia. She's also a retiree from the Ministry of Education after 34 years of service, and her last appointment was as the Head of Department for Quality Assurance at the English Language Teaching Centre. Good morning, how are you? I, I'm fine, uh, Prima. Thank you. I think all our panelists are ready. Before we start this session, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about the webinar session. We love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for any one of our speakers, 
please feel free to send it through the Q&A tab, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Second, for those who are present today, will also receive an e-certificate from us. And if you miss anything, not to worry, the recording of this session will be made available for all. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming Dr. Ramesh Nayef. Over to you. Thank you so much, Prima. Uh, um, before I go into the, uh, the discussion, and I know how fast an hour goes uh, in a webinar, so I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, just on behalf of the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association, uh, I'd like to just record my appreciation to Oxford Paja for organizing this. Um, I think as much as the COVID situation um, has uh, affected all our lives, uh, it's not easy to bring 500 people together in a seminar, you know, back in the day when we, we were not thinking of uh, online um, uh, platforms to, to have uh, uh, discussions. So I think there's something uh, to be gained from, from this experience as well. Mm. Right. As I said, I know how fast an hour goes. And um, I, I've had a quick look at, you know, the, the, the chat column where some of you have been introducing yourselves. We have apparently a range of people with from very diverse backgrounds. Uh, we have, uh, of course, very experienced teachers and educators. We also have student teachers. So uh, it's a pretty broad range. And I'd like to begin the first question by keeping that point in mind. Um, curricular reforms has to take place from, from uh, time to time because the education we provide future generations needs to keep in step with the changing demands and expectations of society. In Malaysia, the KBSR and the KBSM was introduced in the early 1980s. And this has recently given way to the KSSM and KSSR. And clearly, reforms in English language education has been extensive. Uh, we've seen this in, in, in media reports. There's been a great deal of discussions about the reforms that have taken place uh, with English language education. So even before we start talking about assessments within English language, uh, within the English language curriculum, let's very briefly talk about Malaysia's CEFR online curriculum, especially for the benefit of you know, parents and student teachers who may be with us today. So can we get the ball rolling with you, uh, Datika Kumasia? Yeah, okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum and good morning, everyone. So, Dr. Ramesh, you'd like me to say a bit about the, talk a bit about the CFR yeah, some, line some curriculum? Some background about the, the CFR line curriculum. Okay. Well, um, first of all, the, thank you, Oxford Faja and Melta, for this opportunity to meet everyone online. Um, the CFR aligned curriculum really is part of a reform plan that was kick-started by the MEB, the Malaysian Education Blueprint in 2013, which basically, basically called for um, a reform in English language education so that our learners can uh, become, you know, can get knowledge and skills to become global citizens of the 21st century. And obviously that wasn't quite happening at the time with English language. Um, and so they commissioned the English Language Standards and Quality Council, the ELSPC, to develop a reform plan for that purpose, to bring our learners into the 21st century with the uh, appropriate sets of knowledge and skills. And so the result, the outcome of that effort was a 10-year reform plan uh, in full, it is the English Language Education Reform Plan, which has been documented, and uh, we just call it the roadmap. And this roadmap is a 10-year plan from 20 for English language education from 2015 to 2025. And so we are, you know, running at full speed through that plan right now. And uh, the important thing about the roadmap is that it looks at ELE, I, I shall call English language education ELE, as a continuous learning experience, a learning journey which starts from preschool right up to university. English language education and learning does not stop. 
it starts from preschool right up to university tertiary education and before this we had never had a systematic plan to help learners go from that point at preschool to that point at tertiary education uh, or form five if learners uh, leave school after form five and don't pursue um, higher learning and um, so basically the, the uh, reform plan as a result of the reform plan um, we came up with the CFR aligned curriculum now this the, the most substantial change in the reform plan really is the adoption of the CFR as the basis for curriculum, teaching and learning and assessment. The CFR, for the benefit of parents and those out there who have not really familiarized themselves with the concept, is a, a framework for describing and measuring language proficiency at various levels of learning and of education. The CFR stands for the Common European Framework of Reference and it is, you know, don't be too misled by the term Europe in the name. Uh, it did originate from Europe, but it has gone through decades of research in over 40 countries, which are non-European countries. So the, the research has been done on second and foreign language learners in many countries, and they've come up with a framework for helping learners and teachers and educators and parents um, the various stages uh, and levels of proficiency that learners go through as they go through school. Remember this is for second and foreign language learners. Um, and the CFR is basically, it, it, it describes what a learner can do at various stages. And so the framework consists of six levels. Uh, a1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, with C2 being the highest level of proficiency and A1 being basic user proficiency or ability. And then there's also pre-A1. And so this then became the basis for reviewing our curriculum. Yeah, where before, um, as I said, we didn't have a systematic look at English language learning from preschool to tertiary, now we have a framework for doing that. And so our CFR aligned curriculum really, uh, um, it, it's still called the KSSR and KSSM, it's just that it is CFR aligned right now. Um, it has been rewritten to describe what learners can do from preschool to tertiary education using descriptors found in the CFR and the descriptors are basically can do statements which help learners and teachers and parents understand what a learner should be able to do at each level. Okay and so uh, we have now pitched our teaching and learning at these levels. Uh, Dr. Ramesh I believe we have a, a slide that we can share with others. Okay this slide um, briefly shows the aspirational targets that Malaysia has for our learners from preschool right up to university. In preschool, they will at they will be at uh, pre A one, which is just moving towards A one, and then uh, at the end of primary education, they should be at the level of uh, A two, low A two, and then. Going forward into secondary education, they should be developing their proficiency until at the end of Form 5, we hope that they will uh, have reached the level of B1. B1 is now independent user level. And in post-secondary education, Form 6, matriculation and so forth, they will be at, we hope that they will exit that uh, level of education with a B2 which is the higher independent user level. And then as they enter university and go through university, we would like to see them develop the proficiency 
until upon graduation, they exit university at a high B2 level, which is independent user level. The C1 that you see for um, university B2 stroke C1, that C1 is for graduates from English language programs such as BA, Bachelors of, uh, Bachelor of um, Arts in English, and especially in the TESOL programs, because these will be the teachers. So TESOL graduates should graduate with C1. That includes um, graduates from IP GM as well. C1 is already um, proficiency level. So basically, that's what the CFR aligned curriculum is. Um, but remember too that the CFR uh, is not just about levels. It is also about the philosophy of teaching and learning, which focuses on um, what learners can do. Teachers must be aware of that. Learners must be aware of that. Okay. Also, the CFR focuses on communication um, and it focuses on learner awareness. So with these levels and this philosophy in mind, okay, English language education in Malaysia now has a new focus. Okay? And it's also important to remember that curriculum does not work alone. Curriculum is part of a whole integrated systematic um, approach to English language learning. And the three big and major components of this system are curriculum, teaching and learning, and assessment. And so all of these have to be based not only on the CFR levels, but also on the approach and philosophy to English language learning, which is communicative, very positive, focus on helping learners be able to do something. The can-do statements remind us that reminders of that forcefully so basically that's it in a nutshell all right and if you want you know further reading um there, there are links to the cfr uh, and to articles that prof zoraida who is the elsqc chair and myself wrote thank you okay. thank you so much Adapin. so I, I think one of the the biggest takeaways i mean the hope is that the can do statements would make uh, evaluating the proficiency of students, um, you know, it makes it, it, you know, it allows teachers to talk about proficiency in more tangible terms. Correct. Uh, rather than just saying, oh, you know, my student is good or average or weak, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Panjaya, you were a teacher educator, a teacher, a teacher educator for free service as well as, you know, in-service teachers. For a long time, we've, we've always uh, heard comments about how our education system was overly exam oriented. Um, you know, exams were shaping uh, teaching practices in the classroom. To what extent would you regard this to be true? And what do you hope to see as we move forward with the new CFR aligned curriculum? Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Yeah? Good morning to all. Uh, I, I, what I know, I'm going to pick up on some of the grammar you have used, huh, Dr. Ramesh. You, you are using it in the past tense. You say was overly exam oriented. Uh, in the past, we have did this. I think we still are. Mm. As long as we still have the word exam in our education system, okay? And as long as we continue to attach very important decision making based on the results of those exams, exams will always take center stage. And, till, and today, it is still center stage because you notice mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, reaction when we canceled exams, everybody became so concerned, worried, because they thought, oh my God, we need to make decisions based on those results. Now, how are we going to make those decisions? They don't, um, I think many of us are so ingrained with this A's and A pluses and A minus that we forget that students have been learning continuously. And there is so much of evidence already in the classroom that the teacher has 
and the teacher is the best person to know where the child is at. But then again, you see, we have come through the very traditional system of latching on to grades. Huh? And as you said, we need to know who's excellent. We need to know who's good. But then again, what does excellent mean and what does good mean if we don't have a common frame of reference? At the moment, we do not have a common frame of reference. What is A to you doesn't mean the same to me. Probably doesn't mean the same to the parent. Probably doesn't mean the same to the employer or the universities are going to take them in. Huh? So you ask me, um, if you hope to see that we move forward with the new, we hope to see provided the reporting changes, the reporting method changes, then we are moving forward. But if we still rely on a global grade and don't tell people what the grade means, then uh, I don't think we would, there would be any change. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Okay, there is a question yes. uh, posted. Okay, uh, so one uh, participant mentioned that uh, she or he is curious to know more uh, how, uh, on how assessment is done, all right, especially in the writing, when it comes to writing. And one pertinent question with regards to CFR is, do we actually have to inform our students all the time about the level of CFR that they should actually attain? Okay, I think that's a rather uh, quite a specific question, focusing on on uh, uh, written assessment. Yeah, um, maybe we will. Uh, but thank you for that question. We'll keep that in mind as we as we uh, go ahead. Uh, it may be tied to the question that I'm about to ask as well. Um, so, um, you know, you you rightly point out, Ponjaya, that that you know, I'm, I have been, I was you know making references to the past, and you say that this is this continues to be. Um, uh, you know, an issue of how uh, we are very focused on assessments, but is that necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, let's focus now on assessments in the CFR aligned curriculum. Uh, both parents and teachers, like you rightly point out, are anxious about how English language proficiency is to be assessed. Uh, teachers are still wondering about the assessment of uh, English in uh, UPSR and, and uh, SPM, right? Um, you know, for the, for the longest time, our students, uh, you know, sat for English papers in mid-year and final year exams, uh, which were very much uh, follow, which followed the format of uh, summative exams in, like uh, the UPSR and the PT3 and the SPM. And then they reached certain points in the academic journey where they sat for these exams. They were awarded grades. Uh, everyone was quite happy. But then, uh, you know, as Datin pointed out earlier, um, um, there were also narratives, um, there have been narratives for, you know, several decades now, talking about how standards have been uh, declining, uh, you know, in English, and that a student who's awarded a good grade um, doesn't necessarily possess the kind of uh, proficiency uh, that one would expect of someone who has an A in English, for example. So. What happened recently with the, with the PT3 exam was that uh, the English grade was accompanied by a set of CFR descriptors. Um, do you think that we are complicating matters by now adding this new set of, of descriptors um, to assessments? Um, maybe, uh, Ponjaya, you want to take this question first? Okay, I'm just going to go, uh, Ramesh, I'm going to go into the word. You said everyone was quite happy. I'm not sure who, who the everyone was. We were happy as long as it opened doors to us, but did it open doors globally for students? Because I know for a fact, this is from my experience, that students with A pluses also had to take an external proficiency exam because, because, I mean, I'm going to leave it uh, at that, you know, why, why didn't they accept our A pluses? All right, that's one. Then moving on to the, your next point in your, uh, uh, what you said, you said, um, you said um, we have a good grade. Yeah, Again, about, as you said, yeah. good is relative. Huh? And you also asked, are we complicating matters, um, giving the CFR profile? Now, why should, we complicate, why should it be complicating? In fact, they're making it clearer Correct. now. The CFR uh, level reporting clarifies exactly what the student can, uh, a child can do. And there's, uh, there's immediate transparency because you can click in Google and find out what does this level mean 
and everyone from parents to stakeholders to policy makers know exactly what the child is yes. capable of doing. So mm. no, I don't think it comes. So there is, there is a certain need, uh, to a certain point, we need to educate ourselves and familiarize ourselves with these, with these descriptors, even yes. if you're parents, yeah? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, and exactly. the education can be self-education because it is out there. The CFR is in the public domain. It's not held close to the chest by the Lembaga for Preksan or anybody. Unlike, unlike what has been happening now, if you ask someone, um, what were the criteria used? No one seems to know. People don't know. People don't know what the threshold marks are. People don't know what a B a student is capable of doing. All we know is the B and the traditional interpretation of, oh, B is not as good as A. That's all we can say, you know? Mm. Um, so uh, no, may I, it doesn't may complicate matters. May I add to that, yeah, uh, Dr. Yeah, Ramesh? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think um, uh, uh, what Ponjaya just said, and your question actually um, reinforces what Ponjaya said earlier, that the reporting is important. Going back to what we said before, um, an A is a very relative indicator it, it, it really means nothing. What is A? What is B? What is C? We, it can only mean something if one can interpret it to mean something, to, if it tells us what a child can do, what a learner at a certain level can do. Before this, we couldn't say anything. You know, what can an A learner do? And, um, you know, an A learner, an, an A person from a different university or a different school would perform differently from an A person somewhere else and even even more so across countries. What the CFR has done is to give us uh, a common framework for understanding uh, and describing what learners can do at particular levels. So in, in principle, a B1 learner in Malaysia should be able to do what a B1 learner in Japan can do, okay? Of course, you know, with, with some cultural differences, which is why, by the way, we're developing the CFRM, which is CFR Malaysia, okay? It's very much the CFR, but contextualized in Malaysia, and that's it. We are in the process of doing that right now. So coming to, back to your question about whether the CFR, company CFR descriptors on a P33 certificate or any other certificate for that matter, whether um, the inclusion of those descriptors would be a complication, I agree completely with Puan Jaya. They should not be seen as complications. They should be seen as something to help us and parents and teachers and the learners themselves understand what that learner who has achieved that level is able to do, okay? So instead of an A or a B plus, it actually gives the level and tells, what is more important is the can-do statement that a company say. What can that person at that level do with language? So no, it is not a complication. Um, okay. May, yeah. may I also just quickly answer that earlier question about should yeah. learners then be reminded, constantly reminded about what level they have to achieve? Um, the answer is no. The, the, the levels are meant as a guide for um, educators and parents and learners to understand that they are at a particular level. But you do not remind students all the time you have to achieve that level. It's, then we'd be going back to that mindset where you're telling students, yeah, Ponjaya, oh, you have to get an A, you have to get an A. That's not what we want to do, okay? We want students to know you're at this level now and you want to get to that next level and what happens after that, what do you do to get there, okay? They don't have to know the letter levels. They don't have to know whether they're A1, A2. They just need to know what they're able to do now, what they hope to be able to do. So the, the whole approach is actually more positive, telling the child mm. what the child can do. Correct. Uh, rather than, you know, focusing on what the child is unable to do. And so yes. what, the, what the, the CFR level does, for, sh should be doing for teachers is 
uh, informing teachers of what the aspirational target is. And then, uh, you know, through formative and summative assessments, determining uh, where the child is and what needs to be done to take the child to that aspirational. Correct, aspiration. correct. Right. So let's, let's uh, uh, go into uh, talking a little bit more about formative and, and summative assessments. Um, you know, the, the CFR aligned curriculum, once it was introduced, um, teachers had to undergo uh, in total, I think, four familiarization programs. One, one, the first one was familiarization, then there was a curriculum reduction, and one of the four was focused specifically on formative assessments, right? And it appears that there's quite a bit of emphasis on this, uh, on formative assessments now in the new curriculum. Um, so maybe, Ponjaya, you can take this uh, uh, start off but talking about, um, you know, what is that difference between formative and summative assessments as presented in our curriculum in the KSSR and KSSN? Okay, that, that's quite a bit, huh? Now, yes, we have come along. I want to pick up on the word continuous that Dr. Mazia said, because we have uh, recognized the fact that learning is continuous. So assessing them cannot be at one point in their lives after the one year of learning, number one. And we have to make a distinction between assessment and exam, assessment and test and assessment and evaluation. Huh? Now, formative. Um, let me, uh, I, want, I just want to remind our teachers about this um, handbook that was given to us by CE, by Cambridge. Huh? Now, let me, I'm not very good at this, am I? Uh, I need to share, <laughs> just to trigger your, jolt your memory. Huh? I'm going to share something with you. Okay. Remember this, everyone? Yeah? Mm. The teacher handbook on formative assessment, but this is your reference for formative assessment. And what um, will, uh, we are referring to William and Black, of course, huh? the key words for formative that makes it different from summative is number one, it is continuous. All right? It is an on, it's a process. It's not a product, it's, not, it's a process, it's ongoing. Huh? And um, it is evidence-based, meaning when teachers make decisions about how to move forward, what is the next step in my instruction? It is based on evidence. Whereas in summative, there is no moving forward anymore. That is the end of the line, end of the road for the students, all right? So the key, for me, the key word that makes a distinction between formative and summative is that uh, feedback. Mm. Immediate feedback, evidence-based, all right? And uh, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll talk to you, okay? Uh, what else can I say, yeah? And um, what shall I say? Yeah, it's a collaborative effort between, um, it's very interactive, it's a collaborative effort and the most important people in formative assessment is the learner. And the teacher is continuously giving direction to the learner to achieve that success criteria that he or she would have informed the student. Now, I need to get you to uh, complete a, a paragraph of 10 lines. Okay, this is where we are taking you to. And the teacher will plan lessons to take the child to that target. All right. Now, that's not the CAFR target. That is the target for the lesson for the day. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it is also very informal. Most, as they say, most formative assessment is informal. You plan your formative assessment as you're planning your lesson. But the wonderful part about for our teachers is this. I'm going to show you something again. Huh? Do you know your formative assessment is already built into your scheme of work? This I'm talking to teachers. You people, you te teachers are so lucky today. You know, your scheme of work is prepared. Your your what your lessons? Imagine twelve lessons for every skill is prepared for you. The page reference is given. They tell you what to do, when to do, how to do. Plus, plus the formative assessment aspect is also given. And all this is geared towards that cumulative effect that will be tested in the summative, that, uh, in the summative aspect, which will be end of the unit, end of the semester, end of the year. Now, of course, there are some characteristics that are different. For example, why bother? No, you need summative as well. It complements formative because there are some variables, uh, some factors in the formative that you don't want to see in the summative because you're making important decisions. 
Can I show you something from your scheme of work, Dr. Ramesh? Can I show them something in case they say, no, it is not there. No, it is there. Okay, let me um, share screen again. Dr. Mazia, you're smiling, you know why, huh? <laughs> because we're being positive about this, aren't we? <laughs> ah, yes, okay. Yes. Hold on. Uh, no, hold on. I'm not doing it correctly. I need to get... Um, it full screen now. Okay, I need to look at my. Let me show you something. Huh? Um, something that I extracted from the scheme of work and I said, oh my God, it is, it's, you know, it's all there. How wonderful for our teachers. Um, so I've taken down the slide number. Do you all remember, okay, um, I'll go back to the screen, not here, okay, let me share this, sorry to keep you all waiting, huh? okay, now this is something I took from your scheme of work your formative asset your lesson is now you know you've got a different uh, three parts to your lesson you've got the lesson delivery you've got the post lesson and so on now if you look at this lesson delivery all right where it says peer assessment uh, can you see can you see yes we can see this thing. Yeah. okay can you see the line in red Ask yes. people to take each other's sentences and give feedback on spelling. Now, that is, that is one type of formative assessment. This is part of the lesson delivery where you want to know where is each pupil now. And this, this formative assessment is self-assessment and peer assessment. Huh? Then you have another one, post-lesson. I also picked up on this, all right, where you're having plenaries for reviewing learning. This is also formative assessment. And you're using exit cards. To, uh, to, for the teacher to uh, assess the student and see how shall I plan my next lesson? What went well in your learning? Remember those things that you have to do? Your learning, you know, uh, what, how would it be better? This is on formative assessment and it's built into your scheme of work, which means mm. it's part of your curriculum. Okay, mm. so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and summative, on the other hand, we know that, isn't it? It's at the end, they use it, and mostly it's policy driven, it's used for making decisions and reporting. Mm. Uh, do you want me to add anything else, Dr. Ramesh? Uh, thank you. You know, the uh, questions are, are coming in fast and furious. Oh, okay. And, okay. Uh, and uh, yes. so I'm, I'm going to just address a few questions now. Um, one question has caught my, my attention because I think I've heard this narrative uh, elsewhere as well. You know, teachers are introduced, or, or rather, introduced to various programs and activities that are running in schools, right? You have the HIP, and then the, the teachers are told to, you know, focus on train, to train the teachers with, or students with a higher order teaching skills and things like that. And so mm -hmm. teachers see this as one, one additional uh, task or, or program on top of another. And the CFR is now something else that they have to deal with. Now, maybe, uh, you know, one of you may want to, to talk about this, you know, how, um, higher order teaching skills related to uh, uh, HIP and how is that related to the CFR? You know, uh, how do you uh, position these, these, these various uh, terms? Okay, um, maybe I'll just answer something about the HIP. Okay, um, I think one of the things, one of the important things to remember is that the CFR is only one part of the reform plan that I, I talked about earlier. Uh, the reform plan is not the CFR. The CFR is just one big part of it. The CFR has informed our curriculum, teaching and learning and assessment. But another big part of the roadmap, the reform plan, is um, it, it highlights the necessity for us to 
increase exposure to and use of the English language, okay, by our learners. Um, and the, re the roadmap calls for increased engagement with the language. That means increasing engagement time with the language in whatever form, either in the formal classroom situation um, or outside. Okay, We know that there's only a limited number of hours that learners can spend on English language learning within the, the curriculum, the school curriculum. And on that point, there are some prescribed hours as well, right? If you want to I'm sorry, sorry? On that point, there are uh, some, some recommendations for how many hours it takes for someone to move from one level Correct. to the other as well. Correct, yeah, a few hundred hours. And so um, the HIP really was developed to answer that call for increased engagement. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily uh you you we don't have to find an equivalence between cfr and the hip they, they, they're not the different things okay the cfr is a framework for helping us understand where students are the hip program is really to provide the enrichment and the increased engagement with english language so i think we have to get that quite clear yeah but, but uh, i would Madhya. say but uh, hang on, eh? but I would say that the HIP um, would support, it would support the CFR approach to learning because most of the HIP or all of the HIP activities would be centered on communication. They'd be focused on, you know, getting students to interact and communicate with each other and work together to, on whatever activity which be quite authentic for them. And remember that the focus of the CFR is on communication. So in that respect, the HIP activities would support the CFR-oriented approach to learning. Okay, yes, Pundaya. Uh, I have a question that's very interesting. I'm just wondering why, you see, I, I think this has got to be told, that question about how many hundred hours does it take for a, a child to move from one level on the CFR to another? Now, mm -hmm. am I right in saying, Dr. Mazia, based on what you said, that the, um, the HIP, right, the immersion program, is mm. actually to support because there's not enough face time in the classroom, mm. but you need that additional support hours, right, yes, to control yes. the chart. So, yes. number one, number two, so I'm correct in understanding you in that way. Now, number two, um, Dr. Ramesh, why are we seeing that I have to do HIP, I have to do CEF? I don't understand. See, you don't teach the CFR, you teach the syllabus. You teach the skills. Now, your, your, well, the, the job has been done for you. So when I go to lesson uh, nine, and um, I know exactly what skills I'm teaching, and it's pitched at what level. You are not teaching the CFR. You are teaching mm -hmm. skills that have mm -hmm. been designed according to that level. On that, on that right. point, yeah, on that point uh, Ponjaya, there's a couple of questions on this as well that I see here. Um, all right, let's take, let's, uh, you know, I look at an example. I teach a year four classroom, right? And I have uh, my, my syllabus. I know what the, the target is. The textbooks are pitched at that target, but I have students who are not even able to read and write. Or I may find myself in a situation, you know, if I'm teaching in a good school, that my students are way above that. So how, what do I do? And, and how does the, the CFR aligned curriculum support me? You know what? Um, hmm. So, okay, first, first of all, may, may, may I say something? Yeah? Um, I, thank you, Puan Jaya, for basically reinforcing what I said earlier. The CFR is not an exam, nor is the CFR itself a target. It is not a test. It is not something to work. It's not the CEFR that is, you know, a target. The CFR is simply a framework for helping us understand for putting into place a systematic way of thinking about where students are and where we want them to go. That's it. Now, you know, uh, uh, I, I know the question you're asking, Dr. Ramesh, um, I know it's running through the minds of many teachers as if 
it is it is as if the CFR curriculum is now um, how how shall I put it and um, as as though um, sorry let, let 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 me try and and rephrase this you mentioned you know students being at a, uh, not being at particular levels yeah if we hope for them to be at a particular level but but they're either not there yet or they're over it and so um you know how the cfr help the thing is it's the cfr is not a tool or a technique for learning these problems and these issues exist long before we had a cfr curriculum these are issues that have existed since day one of language learning in any curriculum correct what is happening now is simply that the by using the cfr as a framework we just know if let's say year four you mentioned year four that learners at a particular uh, in year four we expect them or we hope for them to be at a particular CEFR level and what level is that what should they be able to do the CEFR descriptors help us understand what learners should be able to do in year four that's it the problem is still the same okay so if if you're asking um or if teachers are asking you know i have these students who are below or beyond you know what do i do there is, um, I think we can go back to differentiated learning, the differentiated learning approach, um, where you vary the, the task or the level of support or the kind of support in order to help learners at particular levels, okay, um, who, who can't quite manage uh, a task that you would give some other students. Okay, well, um, as I was saying earlier, when we have students who are not quite up to um, the level that we want them to be or over, it is our job as teachers to vary, you know, the level of support to do differentiated learning um, and for those who to bring them up to that particular level um, or those who are beyond it, we have to give them tasks that are more demanding um so again you know does this require additional teaching and learning probably yes but my point is it's got nothing to do with whether it's a cfr curriculum or not this would still be going on regardless of whatever curriculum we use okay but the cfr helps us to be clearer about where we should be right i right. i would say that's how it it, it helps yeah. us Okay. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so the point like the point you made just now, this is where the differentiated learning comes in. The hope mm -hmm. is that, you know, in future with the CFR curric curriculum, as a child moves from year one to year two, a teacher, mm -hmm. will be, the receiving teacher will be able to be advised by the teacher from year one mm -hmm. that this is where each child is. And Correct. this child is on target or this child is below target. Mm -hmm. Of this child yes, is yes. And, and the descriptors will make it more tangible, uh, right. you know, as you, uh, the term which you used earlier. Right. Whereas before, you know, we would say, oh, the child is not quite there. Well, what do you mean by not quite there? Or yeah. the child is low proficiency. What do you mean by low? Right. But now we just have a clearer picture of what the child should be able to do. That's where the CFR would help. Yeah. Right. But the problems would still be the same, regardless of whatever curriculum. It is. I, I did catch a, a few questions just now, and a lot of it was about the future, and uh, I, I don't think we are in a position uh, to kind of, you know, uh, anticipate what the future is going to be like in terms of assessments. Uh, there was a question, for example, will the MUAD be abolished? The answer is no, that, that we know. Uh, will the MUAD be abolished? MUAD. MUAD. MUAD, okay. Yeah, really the answer is no. <laughs> well. I, not um, in the that, foreseeable future, yeah. yeah. And then there was a question about the uh, UPSR English paper for uh, SJK and SK schools and whether they would be pitched differently uh, given the, the um, background of the students because those in the SJK schools come, you know, English could be a, not even a second language, but 
you know, mm. a third language. But these are things I think um, we'll have to wait for LP to roll out the uh, the assessments. Mm, uh, and, mm, mm. Uh, yeah, know. these are not questions that we we are in a position to answer uh, or decide on. Yeah. yeah, right now. Okay. May, may I pick up on one, uh, uh, Dr. Yes. Ramesh? Yes, yes, yes. I identified one question from Rekha. Yes. Um, I don't know if Rekha is there, but I, I saw this question earlier from you. Um, and Rekha, mm, I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could go back to that question now, but it doesn't look like it. Anyway, Rekha said that um, uh, she agreed with me, but with what I said about the CFR, but she said different countries have different levels of achievement or different ideas about levels of achievement. Um, and, and I'm going to uh, respond to Rekha um, by saying yes. You are right, different levels will have different expectations of their learners. And um, that doesn't contradict the, you know, the, the use of the CFR as the basis for our own curriculum. You see, different countries may have different target levels for their learners, although I don't see such radical differences. So the targets may change, but the levels will remain, yeah? The CFR levels are common throughout the world. So we, what, what happens is we don't have, let's say six levels for Malaysia that are different from the six levels for Korea. No, the levels are the same throughout. It's a common framework, but maybe Korea will have a different, um, target exit level for their graduates from ours okay that may change and if they have different targets yes but that means they might choose a lower or a higher cfr level but the levels remain the same okay the context of the descriptors might change a bit which is why we have our as i mentioned earlier we're developing our cfr malaysia the context of the descriptors might change a bit, okay? But the CFR levels don't change. Targets may differ across countries, levels don't. I hope that's um, clear to you, Rekha. You know, Jaya, if I could ask you, right, if I am going to be, if I want to sit for a CFR aligned assessment to, to gauge my English proficiency, and I'm asking you this because you are an IELTS examiner, right? So if I'm going to sit for an assessment like that, um, I would probably go online and look at the format of an assessment just before I go in to do the assessment itself, because my aim is to, to know where I am in terms of uh, my proficiency in the language. I would not be too overly concerned about the format. I mean, the format is, is important to some extent so that I, you know, I, have, I enter that assessment with the right frame, frame of mind. So in the same way for, for school teachers, because I see quite a lot of questions about you know what the exam is going to be like if they were clear on what the aspirational targets are for students in the year that they're teaching and you know uh, what they need to do to ensure that the, the child is at that target or beyond uh, how concerned would i have to be about the format of the of the spm or the pt3 or the, the upsr Okay, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. I mean, this has always been my advice uh, advice to teachers. Huh? Why are we so concerned about the test or the format? Our job is to teach. And the people who set exam papers and tests, they test what we teach. So if you teach a skill, that is what is going to be tested. So if you have just taught students how to write a report, well, the, the, the exam may test students how to write a report. They're not going to test you on how you're going to write a memo to a boss because that was not taught. The best thing about our uh, exam is it is objective driven and they are all achievement tests, which means they have to look back at what was in the syllabus. They will never be testing anything that is outside the syllabus. So if you teach whatever is in the syllabus, that's nothing to worry. But of course, there are factors that will be decide 
what goes into the exam because it's a two hour paper and you have just taught for 120 lessons you know but it is all this is going to be condensed in two hours so you also have these other factors to influence which skill is going to take um, what shall I say, it's going to take center stage in your exam paper. But you shouldn't worry about format. For me, that's what I always say. Just teach. So, so if, I, if I'm teaching a particular year, I know what the, the, the learning standards are, right? Okay. And I'm guided by the learning standards. Correct. As long as I ensure that the child has reached those learning standards in listening and teaching and reading, mm -hmm. I think the, the child, regardless of what kind of assessment the child sits for, it's going to be the assessment, a, you know, a well-aligned assessment will okay. definitely tell the child where he or she is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very important, uh, Dr. Ramesh, is well-aligned. See, what's happening now is how many of us, when we prepare, you know, many of us are doing cut and paste jobs. How many of us actually evaluate a passage and say, how many of these, what percentage of this vocabulary belongs to an A2? We don't do that. We are doing a prof we are just doing, you know, this eyeball analysis saying, oh, it looks easy, it looks difficult. No, how do you know it looks easy or difficult? Mm -hmm. You need to reference it against something. So that well aligned, uh, that is the key to having a good exam or a good test. Yeah. Yeah, and on that point, maybe the council may want to caution, you know, at least the, the members who are uh, the, the participants who are here today about the the many textbooks or, or workbooks yes. that are being printed and, and uh, shared out there with the Thank CFR you. Align uh, stamp on these books. Uh, Thank you. One of you want to just comment on that? I mean, I would like to comment on that. You know, sometimes when I ask my trainees, why did you use this passage? They say it was in the course book. I say, really? And I say, who evaluated the course book to tell you that this is a Form 2 level or this is a Form 4 level paper? And what did that those course book writers, what did they measure it against to tell you it's from four level? And then again, what is from four level? So they, many of us don't seem to understand that other than those ministry approved books, we have no clue about who is evaluating the levels in that book. They can claim, publishers can claim a lot of things. All right. And you, I know we have lots of ghost writers as well. All right, mm -hmm. they lend their mm -hmm. names to the cover of the book, but they don't do the writing. So be very, very careful. Teachers have the skills. You already have, you have been equipped with these skills. So you need to do, use your professional judgment, you know, when you uh, set your papers or select uh, passages and texts. There's a whole science uh, behind, behind writing a CFR line uh, book, isn't there? There's a whole what? Sorry. Whole science behind. Life. Yes, yes. It it really takes um, a lot of research, you know, into the content and the level of language um, before one can write a book. Um, so it's it's not that easy to say. You know, this this is a CFR aligned level. Sorry, a CFR aligned textbook pitched at whatever level. You have to be really, really certain about it. It's not just the vocabulary, but the structures as well. Um, so, yeah, be careful what books we use. Uh, there's this question on um, Dr. Ramesh, which, or, or comment, actually comment about how the format of a test is actually. Um, important for primary students to know. Um, so there's this comment there um, that, uh, that students do actually have to know the format. I, I suppose, you know, in the format of a test is important for someone to know just the format, you know, they have what to know. it will look would like, agree. yeah, what it will look Dr. like, Marcia, they have to know. be structured, yeah. yeah. But as Dr. Ramey said, it shouldn't be the primary concern. We shouldn't Correct. go and say, that's the format, that's the format. That's what everyone said. They say, yes. they, they become nervous when they don't know what is the No, that should not be mm. the primary concern. Mm. Yeah. The people so who are in charge know their job. The mm. exam authorities know their job, you know. Mm. So we need so to So I suppose, them. you know, that that's a response for to, uh, I can't remember the name of the participant who asked this question. I, I, in a sense, I mean, yes, it is good to just to know what it's going to look like, but it shouldn't be should. an overbearing yeah. concern. 
I, I think that's the point we're trying to make. I, I just want to read a comment posted by Sarina, or Sarina, yeah, and she's talking about this uh, training on a more comprehensive method of reporting by the teachers may be needed so that everyone can be informed. Uh, you know, uh, current teachers and future teachers, students, parents, and so on. You know about about the CFR. Your thoughts on this? Training on reports on. Uh, training reporting is that right? Repeat the question again. What's the question, Dr. Nami? It's an, actually more a suggestion. Training oh. more comprehensive method of reporting by teachers, uh, mm. rather than just uh, a grade, I suppose. You know, may be needed so that at least parents also become more familiarized with with you know what those 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 levels mean. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. If I may yeah. respond, yeah. correct. Um, first, first of all, if you're talking about parents and the public, they first of all need to be made familiar with what the CFR is and what it is not. Okay, that it is not an exam, but it is a framework. Um, they need to understand how we are now looking at what students can do. So everybody needs to understand that. And that has to be accompanied by the kind of uh, reporting you mentioned, Ponjaya. Not only uh, in certificates, you know, after summative assessments, but also in, you know, formative assessment as well as the learning is taking place. Although that will be more for teachers. Uh, but if we are talking about more comprehensive report for everyone to look at, then yeah, I mean, we totally agree yeah, where Ponya, yeah, um, that teachers would really benefit from training on how to report on stu students' performance and achievement. I, I would want to use the word well. feedback, uh, Dr. Matzia. What's mm. lacking is the uh, feedback that is given at every level of teaching. Mm. You see? Students mm. need feed, specific feedback, concrete feedback, and immediate mm. feedback. Now, you must understand teachers also have very large classes. They have to, so what they have to do is cope with these large classes, you know, decide, okay, mm. th today for this particular lesson, maybe I just focus on the few students who seem to be lagging. So I give, feed, mm. I, I give a very um, comprehensive feedback. I wouldn't go more for the reporting stage as yet, okay? It is the day-to-day the -day feedback that is important to students. And we need to know how to give that feedback. Yeah, I would mm. think so. Yes. I, I know we're kind of running out of time, Anita. But uh, <laughs> I think this is an important question. And it's, it's a question... Go ahead. We, um, um, yes. we have um, all the time in the world today. Question about how teachers uh, can learn more about the CFR, which tells me that there are many, still many teachers, despite the initiatives that have been on the ground, to train the teachers through the cascade model about the CFR, there are teachers out there who still do not have um, or have not had the kind of exposure needed. How important were those training sessions? And uh, can teachers get by without those uh, having attended those sessions? No. Teachers, well, first of all, the cascade, cascade training sessions were essential. Uh, crucial to uh, you know for any teacher to attend um, and if they were not done well then that would have been a big disadvantage um, to any teacher so uh, you, you know from from the feedback from teachers asking to know more about the CFR well first of all uh, to all the teachers out there don't feel discouraged if you think you don't know enough we are all still learning about the CFR. Um, and so the need to, to gain more knowledge and to um, you know, have a deeper understanding of the CFR is something quite normal. Yeah, remember Malaysia is new at this and we are the pioneers, okay? So don't feel bad about it. Uh, if you are willing, if you're all willing to learn, that's a good sign. And there are, are, there are links. I can just add at this point, it's not just teachers at schools, but universities as well. Yes, universities and even people in the education department, the language offices, they need to know, right? 
um, and yes, lecturers, uh, language teachers in universities, everybody needs to know. There are links to the CFR compendium. Um, th there's this book, which is now online. Okay, it's available online. It's uh, not compendium, companion, a 2018 edition. Um, this is good reading in and an important reading but also i i think dr ramesh you might be hinting at the need for the moe to make uh, cfr familiarization or re-familiarization part of the cpd plans and i agree completely this is new for us we do need refresher courses reinforcement courses and enrichment courses okay yeah. because it's here for the long run so yes um yeah yeah i agree you know training more training is needed yeah um, plenty of other questions um perhaps i will i will kind of uh wrap up no. our, our part of the discussion at this point mm -hmm. and then maybe if Prema wants to, you know, Prema feels that we've missed very pertinent questions. She may want to, to raise it uh, uh, at this point, and then we could probably uh, kind of uh, wrap things up. But I think the, the takeaway message is that the hope is that the CFR aligned curriculum uh, will allow us to uh, teach as well as uh, uh, assess student performance in more tangible terms, uh, keeping in mind uh, the can-do statements, uh, which are kind of reflected in the uh, uh, performance uh, des descriptors. And that also, if you are a teacher who is now teaching, you know, the CFR around curriculum, and if you have not had any exposure to the familiarization of the CFR, to the uh, curriculum induction, to formative assessments, then I, you need to reach out. And, you know, there, there are, um, what, what do you call them, Jurulati Utamas in every state. There are other teachers, uh, uh, you know, heads of departments who must have had, uh, who must have gone for the training session. And, um, and so, you know, you need to kind of work that into your professional development program. And I know that the MOE is now working on a set of uh, videos, uh, you know, where teachers are able to access and get the same standard uh, information that everyone else has access to. So I'm, uh, let's hope that that, that set of videos uh, comes out soon. Uh, so yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll pass this on to Prima now. Maybe one or two questions, Prima. Um, Dr. Yeah, Ramesh, can I? The, Dr. Ramesh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Ramesh, can I just so, oh, Sorry, Dr. Mantia, you go first. Should I, should I go first? Yeah. Yes, yes. OK. All right, uh, Dr. Ramesh, um, b before we end our part of the session, I think I'd just like to go back to you know, the, the focus of this session is really on uh, um, assessment in the yeah. SSM and KSSR. Let me just go back quickly to it. We've been talking about summative and um, formative assessment. Um, in, the, in the KSSM and KSSR, the CFR aligned curriculum, again, let's reiterate that both of these kinds of assessment, both kinds of assessment have a place, yeah, in the curriculum. Um, we need summative assessment and we need formative assessment. What has been neglected is formative assessment, okay? So let's not look at summative assessment as an evil. It is necessary at some point. Um, and summative assessment can be as simple as, let's say, a test at the end of a unit, okay? But if that, the, the results of that assessment is not used to shape learning, it's summative. And we do need that. But what has been neglected is formative assessment where formative is to form, is to shape the learning that comes and the learning and the teaching that comes after that. That has to be built on and developed. You know, if we need um, knowledge about how to improve our assessment ability as teachers. That's the kind of assessment literacy we need more of, yeah, Puanjaya? How to do formative assessment um, 
more efficiently. And what we don't want to, to happen is for everything, for learning to be dictated by testing. We cannot do that anymore. It has to be a different mindset now. Yeah, we cannot let the presence or absence of a test determine how we teach. And that has been going on for too long. I remember um, at some point in, in the past year or two, if you recall Dr. Ramesh and Ponjaya, when um, I, I think we heard a teacher say, huh, no, no more tests? Whoa, how am I going to teach now? What do I teach? And we were horrified to hear that because it showed us how some, I hope not many, but some teachers are lost when they don't have a test to teach to. That is what we don't want to happen. Learning must go on, okay, with or without test, with or without this summative tests okay we don't know what's going to happen in the next years the pt3 the upsr you know all that the, the 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 context of that may change the face of it may change we don't know what's going to happen um um but learning has to go on formative assessment has to go on okay so that's what i'd like to Reiterate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jaya, you want to add? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jaya. Sorry. No, I, I find uh, so many questions asking how to do formative assessment. Uh, can we please mm. look? I found the handbook very, very, uh, uh, very useful. And when mm. I attended the training, the trainer actually just unpacked the handbook for us. You know, mm. uh, she mm. took out things from the handbook. So please refer to the handbook. Um, and you will definitely learn a lot from me. Okay, that's one. Mm. The other one is Dr. Ramesh, since formative assessment has so much to do with the teacher and the learner in the classroom. And many teachers have this problem of large classes. Remember the different differing abilities and so on. How to do differentiated, not differential, differentiated learning. Can I again tell, please remind teachers, do you know um, all the information you need about differentiated learning and the strategies is in your scheme of work. Can I just show it to you huh? very quickly, please? Huh? Uh, okay. Um, uh, can you see that? Hold on. I need to share, right? Uh, how do I share this? Hold on. I'm looking for the share button. I can't see it. <laughs> it's down there. <laughs> okay, In the two bar down read. there. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Where is the share screen? And then, can you all see it? We still it see you. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, dear. This is not good. This is not good. Why can't you all see it? Uh, share screen. It says escape to double click to exit full screen mode. Why is he giving me that message? <laughs> Ayah, this is very maybe, sad, you know. Yeah, maybe you can just talk about it, yeah? Yeah. No, let me tell you. It is in the front pages of your scheme of work. And they give you all the different um, methods of uh, differentiated learning. How you can differentiate by instruction. There are, Correct. I think, nine strategies, how we can differentiate by task, how we can differentiate by time. Mm. So please have a look at it. All this has been mm. done by for you by DPK. Uh, make use of it, okay? All right, yes. thank you. I, I, I think the, the message here, basically, you know, yes, the assessments are there and the students are, you know, need to be prepared for the final, you know, SPM, PT3 and PSR. But if you are clear on what the... Uh, learning standards are and you are able to gauge whether your students um, do those those uh, skills that are described in those learning standards, you're fine, right? And the students will be fine in the assessment regardless of 
the kind of format that is, is going to be uh, uh, presented. So I, I don't, I think we've, we've kind of come to the end of the session for now. So um, yes. I, we've tried to address those questions there already. Is there any final parting words from you? Then then we can, we can you know, uh, you can share. I'm sorry, are we, are we waiting for Dr. Prema to give us questions? I don't know. Questions? No, I, I, I think we've addressed, their questions are still coming. So, okay, um, so, all right. I think uh, because you addressed most of the questions and we lost quite a number, yeah. all right. Uh, there's only one final question I think a few did ask. Uh, if you would like to answer, uh, will there be a change on how we, we view assessment today, especially for the past few months and the next few months due to COVID-19? All right, so would there be some sort of a change? Uh, I'm sure teachers now are like wondering as we know all the time, we, we are focusing on summative and now formative is coming in, alternative assessment is coming in. So what is your view? Right, so indeed, these are, these are difficult times. And um, our points of reference is going to be significantly different uh, depending on where we are and what kind of access we have. Now, obviously, if you're talking about language proficiency, uh, and you're talking about understanding uh, the ability of a child, uh, how proficient a child is, there has to be that contact between the teacher and the learner. Uh, and if, you know, uh, technology enables that, then sure, there are avenues for you to, to, to take. I see some postings here about how teachers are using Google Classroom and things like that. But at the same time, I think we need to recognize that there are teachers out there who are not able to reach their students. Um, and so uh, this is something that uh, the MOE will have to, to address uh, and, and you know, provide uh, solutions uh, to the teachers. But I think it's, it's only right to say that if you are going to carry out formative assessments, then obviously that communication and that contact has to be there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether Datin and uh, Jaya, you want to add anything to that? I just want to add that uh, we, are not, uh, we are not the only one in this board. Just let you know how uh, formative assessment has taken over summative assessment. That is why we say we call it evidence. Your teachers every day are looking for evidence to make a decision about that child and what to do next. Okay. Now, if you look at the Cambridge exam, Cambridge has cancelled their IGCSE. Cancelled, don't can you imagine? But they are still giving a grade. And you know what is the grade given on? Based on evidence based. So now teachers are frantically collating all the students in class work. And of course, there's a process involved, procedure involved to rank them, standardize them, blah, blah, blah. But can you imagine how suddenly in class work is going to feed the summative grade? That's why formative, and thank goodness teachers have been assessing them formatively in the process of teaching and learning and keeping all this work as evidence. So now Cambridge has got this new assessment called evidence-based assessment. Thank you. Mm. Thank I, you. I'm also going to, um, at, you know, at this point, make a small note about the slight difference between ongoing assessment and formative assessment. Remember that, uh, you know, the summative assessment is the one at the end. And then um, there is the option of doing ongoing assessment, especially at tertiary level, uh, because I noticed one or two questions from uh, university lecturers. And um, ongoing assessment is assessment that isn't just left at the end, but is going on throughout that period of time, a term or half a year or whatever. But ongoing assessment itself isn't necessarily formative assessment. No. Yes. Unless, yes, unless you use the feedback to yes. um, improve oh, on yeah. learning. Yeah. yeah. If if you do ongoing assessment, you know, some people may think, oh, I, I'm doing formative assessment because I'm doing ongoing assessment, you know, I'm I'm taking the projects and, and whatnot, and so that's formative assessment. It is not. It is mm. ongoing because it is not the the the, the, the one that is, that culminates at the end. Um but ongoing uh, formative assessment must feed into what happens next. Okay, so formative assessment is ongoing, but not on all going. Not all ongoing assessment is formative. Um, I just like teachers to remember that. Mm. 
Yeah, thank you. And if I can just quickly add one last point, uh, Prima. You know, when when the the uh, announcement was made about the cancellation of the UPSR and PT3 this year, there were many in the media. You could see that, right? They were saying good riddance, and they were hoping that this would be a, a something which is permanent. Because the point being raised is, if I am already able to ascertain the performance of of my students based on my, my classroom assessments, and formative assessments. Uh, you know what? What else is the that UPSR exam going to tell me that I don't already know about about the performance of the child? Mm -hmm. So that's that, that's a good point because if the formative assessment has been carried on, uh, has been carried out well and effectively and, and efficiently, then the learners would have learned and teachers, you know, as Juan Jaya pointed out, would know their students best. They would know uh, what students are capable of doing. The summative assessment sets by an external body uh, right. can't quite get that the same accurate picture. So, uh, you, Dr. Prema, back to your question. <coughs> Does this COVID MCO period bring about, will it bring about change? I think so. I yes. think so. But what the nature of that change is, how it would, what exactly it'll look like, we can't answer. It is certainly a challenge for the Ministry of Education, which will have to think about assessment a little differently now. Alternative yes. assessment, I see, will have to come in, you know, to play a, a, a big part um, in the years to come. That, that's okay. what I think. Yeah. But right. what those changes are, we can't say right now. Okay, thank you very much, panel discussion. I think it has been a very, very hot discussion. I'm like actually sweating and I have holding my towel with me. All right. So the organizer actually would like to thank our wonderful panel discussions who have shared tremendous knowledge, which we, I'm very sure, especially we will take away. All right. So for your information, Oxford Paja and the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association, MELTA, are organizing a series of webinars on topics related to education. So do check them out and mark them down in your calendar. All right. So I would like to end this session by thanking each one of you who have taken time to join us for this webinar. And I would like to take this quote from Forrest Graham. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. So the future is unpredictable when it comes to assessment. So stay home and be safe. Have a good day, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you to all. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, on behalf of Oxford Fajar, on behalf of Oxford Fajar, we would like to say thank you for attending. Thank you, um, our panelists. Thank and, you. and thank you for all the attendees. Uh, once again, we apologize for the uh, technical error just now. Okay, this is the first time we are doing it. Uh, I'm glad that everything went well except for that. So yes. do check out next week. Uh, we have our next session, webinar two. Um, the title is Holistic Textual Engagement and Digital Reinventions, The Challenging Literacy Classroom. So it's going to be on Friday, 15th of May, uh, uh, at the same time, 10.30. And we have the uh, speakers. The speakers are Associate Professor uh, Raihana Muhammad Maidid and also Associate Professor mm -hmm. Shantini Pillai. So please, like um, Dr. Prema said, check out the website and then we'll get more detail on it. So with that, thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar and thank you again. Have a nice thank day. You. And thank you. to all the Muslims. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.